nonsense like that. that how, how... Don't start me on that one. That was yeah. Central are back. After a two-year hiatus, we're back in Division 1 and with Chris Tompkinson in the dugout, we're ready to fight back to where we belong. We are Central. We are Central. We are Central. Well, it means everything, doesn't it? Save! Joey Ladlow saves for Central! Central are Murray Trophy champions! Josh Sprint has the ball now for Central! Justin scores! Central scores! So hello guys and welcome to episode 2 of the Central Chat. Today's episode, put that in your podcast. And also, I would like to give a shout out to our very first podcast sponsor, Football Futures. Uh, we're here with uh, Manchester Central chairman and owner of Football Futures, I suppose. It's uh, well, yeah, your, I your, so. your brainchild really, isn't it, Paul? No. Obviously, you, you weren't around for the, uh, the first episode of, of the podcast. You were off uh, scouting players in, in Spain or somewhere yeah, like that, I, I believe. I was trying to. I was scouting yeah. people ladders in Spain, mate. That's what I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. um, obviously, uh, there, man. I've had enough of all this. I'm off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Barcelona Central. <laughs> Don't put it past me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, welcome. Firstly, to 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 the podcast. Um, obviously, as as a club, we do like to sort of be the first in our field within the Manchester Football League. Um, what 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 are your your thoughts on on us us doing this? You know, this I've said it before, and I would always say it again. Whatever people are doing that they enjoy doing, I'm saying fantastic. Like. You guys, you love it. You, Josh, the other media guys. My belief is, you do this. This is kind of where you learn your trade and, you know, you learn all the, the, the good bits, the bad bits, the bugs, all the issues. Because you will go on to do good things in the future and this kind of experience will help you. Whether it's running a podcast or, or just the discipline to run something and edit something and put it out there. So, listen, I'm all for it. You will get bare hate out there. There's no two ways about it. Just like we do when we film our highlights. Um, how many times? I wish I had a tenner for every time someone says, stick that in your highlights, all this, da 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 But then every team at the end of the game comes up to us, nice as pie, and wants them highlights and wants them goals. Same with the podcast. I just think it's great that you guys do it and you love to do it. I, Tomo, the football team, will help as best we can. But I think more power to you. You will get hate. I've already heard hate from clubs higher up the league who, who thinks, you know, I think the comment was, who do you think you are, Real Madrid? I was like, wow, people are just doing <laughs> some things they enjoy and you don't have to listen. If you listen, you, you know, think it's informative or whatever, you take something from it, great. If you don't, don't listen. Don't listen. And I think great for you guys for doing it. If you can get, you know, six, seven, eight episodes out of this and you learn something on the way, then I'm, I'm buzzing for you. Think of all them media people that were with Central, and have now gone on to them great, great, great things. Loads of them, you'll know better than me, but Craig and Emma and, and there's others that have done great stuff, learned to trade and, and gone on. So I think doing a podcast is, is, is just a nice thing to do. It's a bit of fun uh, and long may it continue. Yeah, 100%. I mean, on that note, if there are any football league clubs that are looking to hire anyone, I am available and currently looking. Um, uh, I mean, and I, by I, the way, out there, football league is very good. Doesn't have to be football league; can be high level, non league, and semi pro. Rory's very, very good at what he does, and he's a diligent guy, and he puts the hours in, as proved by doing a podcast. So, yeah, keep up the good work, mate. Cheers, mate. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think it, it go it, like you, you said there about the the fact that we do get uh, a bit of stick from from some of the clubs higher up the divisions even probably lower down the divisions you know that that, that look at it and go uh, what are they doing but I think really it, it shows that we are massive as a club <laughs> within the Manchester League <laughs> that you know the fact the fact that the fact that the we're doing this it doesn't affect anyone else at all it's it's like but they're 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 losing sleep over it I think they are mate I think some people I used to know from you know some cop from Past colleagues losing a bit of sleep over what Central are doing is madness, mate. So but that's fine. That's all good. We'll enjoy it. Listen, I want the days where we're doing it and there's cameras and, you know, there's different camera angles and we're all sat around with a beer and some whatever. And it's that vibe. Right now we're doing it. You were at opposite ends of the country. All of us are. Uh, and I think we will come and we'll get together and we'll do some in-person ones. And what a great bit of fun and banter that will be. 100% watch this space. No snakes allowed. That'll be the title of that one. <laughs>
Yeah, um, do you want to just give us a, a, a little rundown on on uh, what Football Futures is, where it came from, a little bit about your history as well within the the sort of bringing youth players through? Yeah, thanks, Rory. Probably it's a long story, isn't it, which I kind of cut short for a podcast. But yeah, listen, it's the further education programs, isn't it? Sixteen to eighteen year olds coming out of high school, trying to continue to develop a career in football. We know how challenging that is. We know they all think the miles better than they are, Rory. We've been there, seen it worn the T-shirt. But we do try to give people football, regular football at a good level, regular training. And the top of it is we try and knock them into shape. People come to us, man. You wouldn't believe some of the scenes I've seen over the last, I would say over the last 10 years, but certainly over the last 6 to 12 months, some unbelievable scenes I've seen in terms of recruitment and, and lads and ethics and how they are. So, yeah, listen, we try and do the best we can. Doesn't suit everybody. Some people do prefer the more standard, you know, let's call them red brick colleges. But we try to, you know, be at good facilities, play good football matches and give them a chance to, to forge a career in kind of amateur and semi-pro football. Yeah, I mean, I spoke to uh, Chris in the, the last episode about how important youth players have always been to Manchester Central. We've always had a sort of younger, a younger team compared to other teams within the, the Manchester Football League. Obviously, having this partnership with Football Futures and, by extension, Morecambe, uh, how do you think that's going to going to improve the the sort of setup at Central? Listen, for Central, it always was the lifeblood. Remembering that Central only exists right now. What we've been the club for, I can't even remember. Is it five or six seasons? It was only a club because of our previous academy down in Manchester. You know, Feta, the Football Education Training Academy, where we had lads for two years, very good players. Whether we'll get that breeder player ever again, I'm not so sure. Corey Bentley Knight, Paul Riley, Dan Parker, Josh Frith, you know, the name was the names would go on. Uh, Liam Turner, everyone that came from Feta, the academy at the time, needed an, an exit route into adult football. They weren't good enough to jump into counties and things like that straight away. Many of them weren't good enough to even play Manchester Premier League, which is a damn good standard. So I felt at the time to make our academy what it was and what it needs to be, it needed an exit route for our players. So we 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 re-established Manchester Central Football Club. We played at Luigi Lorino. We've had about a million home grounds over the last six years. Uh, but yeah, it gave all them and think where them guys are now. You know, we could reel them all off. Couldn't we? Corey Bentley Knight flying at Northwest Counties. Things we chat and Elvis the same. We've got other lads even gone higher. Joel Senior was with us down at Platte Lane in the Fetter Academy. Now plays for Morecambe First Team, which is amazing to see. And the list honestly would go on of players. Jordan Hadlow massive unbelievable servant for Manchester Central they've all gone on they all came from a typical college academy they played the Central and now they're flying in non-league football so it is a good story we do get some stick along the way we take it on the chin we take it with a pinch of salt it's a bit of a laugh but some lads have done really well out of it and one day hopefully on your podcast you'll get a few of them on to speak for themselves yeah I mean that would be amazing to be fair I know that we have had quite a few players you know there's a lot of people within the Manchester League that sort of look down their noses at us because we, we try and do things a bit more professionally. We try to do things to a certain standard that we hold ourselves to. And I think that you, you those players that you've reeled off, you know, that have gone on to, to play at a much higher level than any of the lads that have sort of come up against us and, and you know, laughed at us. But who's laughing now? Yeah, well, yeah. No, listen, they've done great. Listen, I wish I had more time on my hands to go off and see these guys playing. I'd love to be out of chat and watching Corey score a last-minute winner or, or, or John Hadlow somewhere saving a penalty. And, and all the, all them lads that are playing, listen, one day we would. Look, we've got our hands filled with Manchester Central. Love it or hate it, for better or for worse, whether we should or shouldn't be doing it, we do, for the love of it, all of us, for nothing. Costs us money, in fact, doesn't it? Uh but yeah, I'd love one day to see all these lads developing. And I just hope there's more. You, you touched on it, Rory, with Football Futures. Yeah, that's been... Uh, in terms of plays for Central, we've already got two lads that have been starting. They've started every game for Central this season. The 16 years old, Ebu and Jürgen, both very good players. Now, all them lads we just talked about, your Corey Bentley Knights, your, your, your Elvises, and your, you know all, all them ones, your Jordan Hadlows, there's, there's more, I, I should remember them all, but... They only really got to play for Central, adult football, at the end of their college life, after two years, you know, when they were turning 19 years of age. We've actually got two Football Futures guys at 16 years of age, 16 going on 17, who are playing now and starting and holding their own in Manchester Division 1. So it does make me proud. It's probably the only reason we still turn up in the rain and the cold, uh, because we see them positive stories. So hopefully long way may it continue, but 
uh, Spurs watch this space. I want to talk about now the, the, the start of the season. Obviously, it, it's not been what we wanted. We wanted to sort of hit the ground running. We had quite a good pre-season. Um, it just it hasn't quite clicked in the, the opening few games. Um, obviously, I live quite far away, so I, I haven't been able to, to get down to, to any of the matches so far. What, you what do you think? I've seen you on social media, liking it when we score and stuff, Rory. We're yeah. not there in spirit, mate. Don't you worry. Uh, it's it's, it's got to be done. Um, how, how, what, what do you think has, has sort of, not necessarily gone wrong, but the, the things that we need to improve on uh, to, to sort of get into a flow, get into a rhythm? Listen, it's the same old story, Rory. You, can, you know, all the teams in these leagues, I'm going to speak for everybody, you can have a great team one season, bang average team the next season, and it can just be a cycle like that because it's kind of a double-edged sword in it. As well as you do, the players leave. They think, they think they can leave. They think they can play higher. And actually, some can. You know, Fuad, number one goal scorer for us. Great player. Great player for Central. Now, at, uh, I think he's at Hyde, isn't he? Yeah, he's on the bench. He's been sat on the bench four times on the bounce and not got a minute. But he is at that level and he's in the mix. And one day he'll probably come on last minute, bag a winner, and that'll be him off to the races. Uh, Corey was the same, I suppose, when he first started out. So, like, we have a good team. People do well. People leave. And you start again at the bottom. And that's us at this season. We, our team has probably two players in it from last season. Two. Sometimes not even two. It's all brand new players. And it does take one hell of a task to, to, to sort them out and get their head out of the clouds of where they should be and what they think they are. And we try and knuckle them down. We try and knock them into shape. And we try and get some form of team out of them. It's like trying to get a tune out of them, really, Rory. And we haven't really managed to do it. We've, we've been okay in little spells of the games, the ones I've seen. I'm sure Chris, if he was here, uh, would say we've looked okay at times, but then we've looked soft and weak at times. So we said it, we said it at training, we've said it, look, we think we'll probably see the best of this team in two months' time. Some out, some in, they'll knuckle down, they'll get fitter. And then Rory, I'd like to think we might see us picking up some results, but trust me, mate, and when I say this, this season was not about, like, let's get promoted, let's do this. Yeah, we talk a good game and, and you know, we won them, you've you got to keep a brave face on what you're trying to achieve. But realistically, we've just got to compete this year and uh, keep our heads above water, really. So, yeah, ask me again in two, three months' time how we're doing, and I think it might look a little bit rosy than it does now. You know, obviously, so far, two defeats, one draw. On paper, it doesn't look great, but when you look back at some of our more successful seasons as a club, um, obviously the the Division 2 season most recently, 21-22, we lost four of our opening five games. The only one that we won was a 3-1... Yeah, it was, and it was, it was a, a the only game that we won was a three-one win against Cavaliers, who ended the season with a minus two hundred and seventeen goal difference. No. So three one's pretty close. A three-one win. Is... We should be worried yeah, about it's, 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 Cavs three-one. Now they, they you know we know about yeah, Cavs. We've got good relationships not... with them. It probably shows where we were, doesn't it, at the start of last season? If all we did was beat Cavs three-one, so good to hear, really. Yeah, you know, and, and then like I say, you know, we kicked on got promoted the season 17 18 in the division one season where we got promoted to the premier division um we lost 4-1 and 4-2 in the opening the first two games of the season the year that we were in the premier division when we finished so close to to winning the title you know after that unbelievable run towards the end of the season mm-hmm. again we lost 5-2 twice and drew one all in the first the the first three games so it does it does go to show that the opening few fixtures yeah. Although they haven't been what we would have hoped for, that it, it's not the end of the world. It's 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 a, we're not great a, starters, a bump in the road. Yeah, we're, we're not great starters. I'll admit to you, it was when even when me, uh, I was the manager and Kyle assisted me, we had similar problems in every season. Uh, I think it's because I go on all day for three weeks during pre-season, Rory. <laughs> I think I abandon everybody and we go a bit of shit and then I come back. But uh, no, the truth is, it, it's the turnover of players. That's what it is. It's every single season. It's annoying, but it's every single season. The turnover of players makes us then have a new team every season. That's the truth. We've never had a consistent team season to season. So, like you say, you know, we, we do mean well. We, we're good coaches on our day. We, we put loads of effort in. You know us, Rory. We're out till pouring down 11 o'clock at night on training pitches. And we do put a good shift in. Fair play to Tomo. Tomo showed a lot of the burden over the last couple of seasons. It'd be nice to get a couple of assistant managers to support Tomo. If anyone's out there, you know, give us a shout. You can get your, you know, get your feet under the table in the Manchester League and help out. But 
we uh, we just have a new team every year, but we put it in, and then two or three months go by where we've coached them and trained them, and we kind of put our influence on them, and then we're a much better team. So let's. I hope that's what happens this year, but this year has had its own difficulties, let me tell you. Yeah, one of the things you, you touched on there was the, the consistency um, of sort of players, player turnover. I mean, already this year, with, with three games in, and we've got players who, like you said, think that they can play above. They think they're better than, than, than what they are, where, where we are. Um, yeah. You know, there was we've had lads disappear halfway through the game because they haven't been subbed on and, and they're not happy and, and, you know, nonsense like that. that how, how, yeah. that how difficult is it? Genuinely, how difficult is it to, to, to deal with some of those things at the beginning of the season? Obviously, we hope that towards the middle and end of the season, the lads that are there are going to be ones that have committed so much time and, and effort to, to the cause that, that they're going to, going to hang about. But obviously, like you said, at the beginning of the season, it's, it's difficult to, to get that consistency. Roy, listen, if they, if they stick it out, if the, if the ball's enough to stick it out and listen to us and kind of do what we're asking from them, they, have, they become successful as individuals and as a team. The biggest problem, and we could line up 25 managers here of amateur football, non-league football, we could line them all up and they'd all say the same, I think, lads have changed, attitudes have changed, characters have changed, hard work, discipline, effort, punctuality, consistency, it's changed, it ain't there. Now, we'll try our best and you know we'll get a lot out of these players. And we've got some belting players. I did training last night, uh, 15, 16 lads there, small side of game, 8v8, lively, sharp, loud, aggressive. But, you know, you get out of them one minute and it's not really like that, you know, the next minute. So, yeah, I just think we got to hope some lads do knuckle down. I've, see, I've seen it all so far this, this season. I had to walk on the, almost the middle of a pitch the other day to, to kind of sort one of our lads' heads out because he just wasn't doing anything. He wasn't doing anything and I'd had enough. Felt like going home myself. Felt like sending him home. So yeah, well, this is what the challenges of this level of football. Some teams are solid and got mature players. We played some of them this season. Uh, I think one of the previous home games we played at home. I remember, uh, I think it was Tim Whistle. Look at Tim Whistle. The mature. They're older. Yeah, they might not be the amazing players, but you you know what you're gonna get from them and the consistent. And a lot of teams are like that. Manchester Central are not like that. So that's something for us to think about moving forward. Whether we can ever change that, Rory, I don't know. Yeah, you, you said earlier about the, the fact that we've only sort of got two-ish players from, from last season. Uh, of the, the new lads that have, that have come in that, that you've seen, who have been the sort of most positive? Obviously, uh, we've got the likes of Jürgen and Ebu coming through Football Futures. You said 16, you know, they're, they're, they're really being thrown in at the deep end. Uh, for for that that early on during in adult football, um, how how have you been been uh, impressed with their performances so far? And is there well, anyone else that that's they've, they've done out? great? They've, they've certainly Ebu have fought the last couple of games. Tomo reported back to me of he showed maturity. He was shouting. He was he was he was trying to put his influence on the rest of the team. You know when things weren't going well, he could be heard. Uh, Jurgen's a slightly different kettle of fish. He, he's kind of lively, live wire can make things happen. Attacking third. He needs to learn the other side of the game, maturity and discipline, and you know, and they're being switched on. But talent in the both of them, fantastic. They're players that will play for us and go higher, hundred percent. But they aren't what we should be relying upon. You know, we've got some real stalwarts like a Dan. Dan's been uh, been amazing at the back. Yeah, doing really well. We've, we've changed from right back to centre half. He was at training last night. He's the best player in training. He was wanting, asking me, has he proved his worth as a number nine yet? And all that carry on. So he's the kind of guy. If you had sixteen. Dan's and a couple of Ebus and Jorgens, you're flying. That's what we've been all along. But we've got a lot of periphery going on currently and we need to kick them into gear. There's some talent. There is some talent. Uh, Lamin I really like. The left-sided player, really good. We've seen a new goalkeeper come into training uh, last night. Watch this space on him. Absolutely class. Couldn't believe the performance. Uh, and we do need a keeper because, as you know, our first-choice keeper, Aaron, broke his wrist and he's out for many months, maybe. And we needed a keeper. We're desperate. We had to throw a young kid in on, uh, young Orman on uh, on last Saturday, and we lost. Probably was going to. 
Uh, he's done well for us and, and he, he'll play again and he'll improve. But I think the, the more mature, all the bigger keeper turned up training. So he's good. And we've got some, you know, other good players. Ty on his day is a tremendous player. Attitude could improve, let's make no mistake. But Ty could be a tremendous player on his day. And then we've got some of these other lads that, you know, Osmonds and Brightons and, and uh, Dimitri, the forward, who scored a couple of goals against Tim Whistle, including the chip and the free kick. So we've got the people... We just need to get the best out of them, Rory. Next, next, next month coming up, um, five games, so it's quite, quite a, an action-packed month. Um, do you think that having those games in quick succession is going to help with getting that consistency and sort of working out who's in and who's nah. out? <laughs> who's out? Who's yeah. kicked to the curb? Yeah, right. it as it is, Rory, yeah. yes, it will, it will yeah. do that because we're told people now, right? Listen, three, four games in, we need to start seeing something. You know, with all due respect, we play... We've not had a great start. We're playing East Manchester on Saturday, who haven't had a, a great start. This exactly the same as us, I think. Lost two, drew one. So it's two kind of teams that, like, you know, someone's got to hit the ground running here. Someone's got to start their season. So, if we, you know, let's see if we get a little something from that game. Let's see if people can stand up and be counted. Uh, nobody downing tools. Nobody walking. Nobody pulling out of tackles. That's what we need to see now. Uh, and we'll stand back, myself, Tom, or whoever else is there, and we'll stand back and we'll watch our own two eyes at whether these lads can do it. Uh, listen, Rory, sometimes the game isn't even the biggest problem. You know, signing on fees, paying the subs, turning up to training, they're the biggest problems at this level of football, certainly at Manchester Central. If these lads, you know, where wouldn't pay subs and stuff at this level? They have to. This is how these kind of clubs run. We're not funded by anybody else other than mine and Tomo's pockets and the lads' subs. So if lads don't pay subs, then we won't even have a club. We'll be pulling out the league after 10 games. And we don't want to do that. And we don't want to be them guys. Shocking thing to do. But lads have got to start maturing, doing what they're asked, doing things like paying their subs and being on time. So that's probably the, the truthful element here we're talking for Manchester Central Football Club. So, uh, again, it's another one. And watch this space how we progress next next couple of months, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, Manchester Central don't have a Rob Smethurst to come in. and <laughs> We certainly don't. We do have a Paul Maguire, though, so don't worry about that. But now nah, we don't. We don't have the rich benefactor. We don't. Uh, we're not as fortunate as some of them other clubs. And we're just not. You know, my money goes on my daughters and my holidays and, and my house and stuff and living and going out with, with my wife. Yes, we're looking for sponsors. You know what? We have got a couple of sponsors lined up and we've, we've had a few over the last couple of months that have paid for kits. We've also had, you know, guys like Martin McEverett who's been amazing for us with IMAP. We could not have ran the last few seasons without his support. But listen, it d doesn't do my heart or my emotions any good tapping up people for money and can you give us this, can you give us that. I don't like doing it. It's just not in me. I prefer it coming out of my pocket and Tomo's pocket. So we'll just see how we get on with that. We're trying everything we can to build a sponsorship. We had a, a kind of mini version of a of a commercial guy come in to see if he could contact some local businesses in and around Manchester for the odd 20, 25 pound, you know, sponsorship of this, sponsorship of that. It would all add up. It takes about seven grand to run a club at this level. And that's even with the tremendous facilities we've got at Seashell Trust, great home ground. Training venue at East, uh, uh, Manchester Academy, Moss Side, brilliant training facility, but they all cost money. So, again, it's not a sob story, it's just the realism of this level, and you know, again, it's not easy. Yeah, that's the, the, the hard fact of, of sort of Manchester, the Manchester Football League. It's, 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 it's not free, it's free to come and watch. And I mean, if anyone wants to come down and watch, feel free. Like you said, we play our home games at the Seashell Trust. Um, keep an eye out on Twitter and, and Facebook and stuff for, for uh, information on when we're playing, where we're playing, what time kickoff is, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it all costs money to run at the end of the day. Certainly does. Everyone's the same. Look, we're, Roy, we're not one of them clubs that have got you know their own clubhouse and that kind of stuff where you know locals come in and buy a pint and watch some Sky Sports and buy a pie. Listen, would we love that? Yeah. Could Manchester Central be a pretty big club in its own right if we had that kind of facility? Yeah, it probably could and would be, but we don't. And we've had lots of meetings with Manchester Active and all the different Eastlands Trusts over the years and everything about grounds and places and venues. It's never really come off. Listen, Seashell Trust is amazing. Good changing room, fantastic big 4G pitch, nice catchment area. And they are making some developments there that might actually suit us moving forward. But Manchester Central... 
kind of needs its own ground like everyone else has. Without that, where are we going? We're just going to be a Manchester League team, you know, treading water. So, yeah, it's something we've always looked for. Maybe it's a ground share in the future with a, a, another local club and you can kind of work alongside each other. If you could ground share with a county's team where you're a bit of a feeder into that club and you play your alternate games on Saturdays, realistically, that's probably the most we could probably achieve in this kind of medium term. So we'll probably, again, watch this space on, on that one, really. Yeah, happy days. Um, so now we're going to have a, a brand new segment of the podcast. It is the Manchester Central Quick Quiz. Uh, so it's three questions uh, all about... Is this uh, for me? Am I, the, am I answering? You are answering. You are answering. Oh, yes. And one of, the the question, quiz, one of the questions Question is very down. specific to you. Question number one. It's an easy one to start off with. Uh, who is Manchester Central's top scorer of all time? That's not as easy as you think with some with, with, with but it's got to be Corey Bentley Knight, hasn't it? Corey Bentley Knight, indeed. For a bonus point, he's I'll not give played you for two about ten time. years. How is he still the yeah. goal scorer? That's worrying, isn't it? Go on. Well, I mean, when, when you when you when you see how many goals he scored, this is the bonus point question. I'll give you two either side. How many goals did he score in competitive <laughs> games? Guy. Thanks, Roy. That's class. That Corey Bentley You're very well played for us. I think for. Three seasons. He had a little gap. We'll, we'll never forget Corey's little sabbatical when he sodded off to play for someone else. <laughs> Left us in the lurch when we were almost... Yeah, they always the come back, though. But then he came back and did well. So I think he probably scored... I don't know. Uh, 54 goals. Higher. Ooh, 72. Higher. Wow. 81. Lower. 77. He scored 77 goals. In that, any idea about how many games that was? Uh, ooh, I think it was no. only about 100 games or something. Josh, Josh will be able to tell you. Really? We'll get That's Josh to put it into the script. Yeah. Yeah. I reckon the Corey fact, can't man. have played any more than 100 games. Can't have? So we'll see. No, probably not. Yeah, it wasn't... It wasn't. He wasn't there for... Well, he was, he was there for a, for a while, but we don't, we don't, you don't play too many games within the season, I suppose. No? Thinking about it. Okay. Well, yeah. I, well, I'm throwing that to you as the host of this podcast. I want proper stats next time. Don't be giving me this wishy-washy stuff. <laughs> I scored this many goals and I don't know how many games. Come on, up your game. Uh, yeah, I'll blame the fact, man. Yeah. Uh, question number two. What is the highest division a former Manchester Central player has played a game in? Ooh. Now, this, this this wouldn't be as easy as you think, this question. We'll need some of our absolute, you know, stalwarts of Central to know this. Maybe a Kyle Lord could know this. Because are you saying just played for Manchester Central? Because we did have an under-21 team back in the day. Very first team we ever had was yeah. under-21. And it could be someone from that. So, I'm going to guess you maybe didn't factor that in. Maybe you did. So... Because that would probably be... I'll tell, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that it's as cheap. far as I'm aware... Are you saying reserve players? Are you saying they played in first or reserves? No, no, no. So this is, he, 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 for, he played for the first team. For the first team. For, for this club. So it's um, not... And it's not a central, uh, yeah. as far as I'm aware, he played one game. Ah, of course I know it is. What am I even on about? I'm not going to answer it because I know it is. Do, what, do I have to answer that question? And it's not lambing. What? We all know it's not lambing, but it's most certainly his little sidekick, his best mate. It's Carlos Mendes. What league was it? What league did, what league he, play did he play in? Play in? I think he ended up playing in. Yeah, he might have even played for Luton in the Championship, did he? He did indeed. The there EFL Championship. There you go. Listen, anyone out there wants to remember that game? Wow, what a game. Here you go. I'll throw it over to you. We had Lamin and <laughs> Carlos both playing. One hell of a team on yep. paper we had, man. Big, like, big team. I think something like we might have gone 4-0 up and lost 5-4 or something crazy happened. I think Zach Bell got sent off that day. I remember Kyle getting sent off and getting to stand on the other side of the white <laughs> barrier. I think that's that day. The day when we would have thought someone was going to get hammered by us because we had them two class players, we were pretty poor, we were pretty rubbish. Now, that might not be the same day, but it was a definite day with them two in the team at Pennington and we lost, and it was ugly. So, just for factual reasons, you can have the game. It, we lost 5-2. Right. Zach Bell got sent off. Uh, former central player Boyk Bafana got sent off for Pennington before he even ever signed for us. And he had 
The team was Jordan Hadlow, Tom Greenfield, Paul Riley, Dan Parker, Lamin, Liam Ellis, Umar Kande, Corey Knight, Carlos Mendes Gomez, and Mauro Mendes as a team. What a team on paper, by the way. Did you read that out on this live pod? Did Rory, that information we just got shared there by Stato, is that going on the podcast or is that for the... the, the yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Yeah, because that was one hell of a team on it to lose 5-2 to Pennington or something. Yeah, it's, it, do you know what it, it sums up Manchester Central really in, in a whole. Do you know what I mean? We, we yeah. can we can have the 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 best team in the world on paper, and mm-hmm. there's always something that that yeah. that goes on. God bless but Carlos then, and Lamin when... that day, but they looked like deer in the headlights. They were capable of playing football league, but they were not capable of playing at Pennington away on a bit of a slopey pitch with a few daisies knocking about against a kind of you know rough and ready group of lads that are committed. And we'll put tackles in and all that. No, wasn't capable. So it just shows, doesn't it? You have to be cut out for the Manchester League and the Cheshire League and, and all these. You have to be cut out for it. It's no good to say, oh, I could play here, I could play there. Because on any given Saturday in the Manchester League, you can get your ass handed to you. And that's just the truth. So there you go. Good good stats, that. But there was a few wanting this. So honourable mentions, aside from Carlos, for the likes of Elliot Rocker, who played an under-21 game, a load of under-21 games uh, for Central. I think... Uh, any other honourable mentions? Maybe go to the likes of Tom Greenfield, Northwest Counties, Jordan Corey. Uh, who was the next highest after Carlos? Do you know that? Got me lambing. It, it would have been. Um, it had been Shake Tiam who played for the reserves. He was in the squad for Fleetwood in League One as well. Mm. Well, there you go. Well, very good. So there you go. Some players have pulled on a central shirt and, and gone on. Not that we did everything for them to make them that way. But we certainly were a little holding. They're in a little holding pattern. Some of these lads at central, and you know, it kept them engaged. It kept them on the map sometimes. So there you go. Yeah, it just goes to show that you know we're. It's it's something that we're we're very proud of as well. The fact that you know we get these lads in, they do a job for us, and then we're more than happy to to see them flourish and and yeah. and go as as high as they can. Really, absolutely, absolutely. So then question number three, the last question of the central quick quiz. There's only three on questions your in one... the quick quiz. There's only three questions. Only it's three. a quick quiz. Kyle's it's quiz a quick is better than this. Yeah, they're not as good questions though. Go on then. Quality, not quantity. <laughs> so question number three, on your 100th game, Paul, yeah. for, uh, as manager of Manchester Central, we beat Hayside 1-0 in the Gilchrist Cup. Courtesy of a 93rd minute winner by which player? Well, well, Hayside won't thank us for this, but we all remember some of the famous Hayside scenes over the last couple of years. Some of them scenes have kept <laughs> us kept us going on dark winter nights, haven't they? When it's popped up on yeah. uh, you know the anniversary of the water bottles getting thrown up in the air away. Yeah, but the home one. Now, there was two particular games against them which had worldies. I think there was the worldie, bit of passing... Shot by Corey, keeper parries it, Josh Friff volleys one in. We all go mad. And I think the one you're talking about is someone puts Dan Burns through on goal, bearing down on the keeper, little dink, wheel off, celebrations, goal. So it's Dan Burns every day of the week, got to be. Dan Burns, correct, into the next round of the cup. There you go. Uh, we love a cup run at Central, don't we? We do love a cup run. We're bang average sometimes in the league, but we love a cup run. <laughs> we love going to Hyde. We only ever play finals at Hyde three times, and it's been at Hyde three times. We need uh, the Manchester Football League to up the game next time and get us a, a new venue. Yeah, the Etihad. Yeah, <laughs> the Etihad, yeah. Be good, wouldn't it? Should be, no, actually. When you think about it, like Manchester Football League, I know it's great at your hides and all them grounds. It is good, but wouldn't it be great that they can just pull out some miracles and get you out of some bigger, bigger kind of greater Manchester-based stadiums? Reebok Stadium, or, you know, Bolton's ground, or I don't know, something like that. So we'll see. We'll try and get to another final, and we'll try and have that on the in the calendar. Might be a bit of a push this season, though. Let's see, though. We, we've spoken a bit already about your sort of history with bringing through young players through different uh, academy projects. Uh, are you aware that one of the the protégés from one of your projects scored his first international goal the other day? What, for an international team? For an international team. And I'll tell you I the country be... that he scored for. 
I could probably it was, guess it, who it's going to be off the top of my head now. I haven't even seen this. Uh, yeah. But, but go on, tell me, the, uh, uh, is it in uh, Australasia somewhere? Yes. So it was uh, it was a, an Olympics qualifier for Samoa. Oh, Samoa. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, that's, I, you threw me there a little bit when I said that. It's got to be Kaya, hasn't it? Kaya Kaya Cahill, indeed. Ah, there you go. Kaya Cahill, what a, what a top lad. Dad's a legend. Great family. Came to us, yeah. Came to us back in the Mac days and we kind of dug him out of a hole a little bit at a time because he was, he was a bit late to the country and he was struggling to sign up to any kind of programme and even have a place to go to for education and we moved a few uh, mountains and, and got him on, on board and got Kaya in. And Kaya did well for the short period he was with us there. You know, he, he progressed as a player. It, one thing he was, he was just a great kid from a, from a fantastic family. So, yeah, it was nice. We've seen a bit of Tim Kale along the way. Really good guy. Uh, yeah, so well done to Kaya, I suppose, you're saying. And, uh, I don't know, I don't think we'll ever get another player from one of these programs. Maybe we would, actually, because, like you say, some of the lads can play for some really, like, you know, is it Samoa, you said? So yes, I believe that was the... That's his, obviously, dad or mum's heritage, isn't it? So... Some of the yeah. other lads have probably got heritage at some of these kind of smaller nations where maybe they can, they can get in into the side. So, well done. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, definitely. Been... Qualifier, eh? Well done. Uh, so, Paul, going to sort of move away from, from chatting about Central um, for the time being uh, and just talk about sort of general football things. Obviously, something that's uh, the, the, the major sort of story of the, the last month or so has been the Lionesses getting all the way to the uh, World Cup final. Um Women's football in England is is really taking off at the moment. What what's your sort of opinion on it and the the, the success that it's having at the moment? I tell you what, mate, it's taken off in my household. Let me tell you, we, you know, with a missus and two young daughters, they're loving it. You know, Hannah, God bless her, not the biggest of football fans in the world. Let's be honest about that. Even even married to me over all this time, been together twenty five <laughs> years, and only now has she got inspired by football. And that's by watching the girls and the Lionesses and, and Man United, more to the point. Uh, they all love going to the games. They go to Lee Sports Village. They go to the games. They've got season tickets now. So, yeah, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that in the dominated household of, of what I've done over all the years, it's the women's football that gets probably spoke about more. So, it's great to see. Listen, was I a huge fan of that over the years? Not really. But I am amazed by how much it's come on. And I do actually like watching the games now. I think the standard is 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 risen through the roof. I think the knockout stages of the World Cup were class. We all watched it. The semis against Australia and the final against Spain. They were proper games. They were very decent football matches. And, you know, easily alongside some of the men's games you'll watch. So, I think in terms of the growth, it's is, is been amazing in women's football. The Maguire household has certainly got involved in it and, and go and watch the games uh, see one of our good friends down there, Wilco. He's the goalkeeper coach for Man United. I used to play with him back in my Morecambe days, and he's obviously one of the ones responsible for training Mary Earps and how well she's done. So, a bit of a shout out on this podcast to Wilco. Uh, he's done a fantastic job for United ladies. So, yeah, let's. Uh, I'm sure the ladies' football will just go from strength to strength, mate. And uh, yeah, it's good to see. Yeah, I mean, you said there about. Um... Hannah and the girls getting United ladies season tickets. So I'm obviously a Reading fan, as we can see from behind the thing there. Um, I had a Reading ladies season ticket last year after the uh, the well the, the Euros final win. Um, decided to sign up. You know, it's it's How it's also very it? accessible. Did you, to, did you go to some games, mate? How did you find it? Yeah, I went to a few. Yeah, I did go to a few games. And do you know what? It's it it, it is it, it's good. It would be it's it's a shame that there's not as many people going along, but. I think that it's definitely com like you, compared to three or four years ago. I know that I um, Chelsea ladies used to play at Staines Town, which is just down the road from me. I used to go and watch them sometimes. You know, there'd be there'd be two, three hundred there, and now you've got little teams like Reading getting one thousand, two thousand. It's going. For, it is definitely going from strength to strength. Mary Earps, like you said, she was at Reading and then went to move to United, and now oh, right. England's number call? one. She's flying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You watch it. Let's be honest, right, when you watch it, and by the way, I've just looked at my camera and how dark it's gone. I've not turned the light on and everything, so I'm going to stay in the dark <laughs> for now. Shows how long we've been doing yeah, this podcast. But <laughs> Mary Earps, like, when you watch her, she actually is a proper goalkeeper. Like, I think most of us would probably say 
one of the weakest positions you see in ladies football is, is the goalies. Sometimes you're thinking that maybe, you know, maybe they've not got as much reach or maybe they're not as, you know, coming off the line as quick and all that stuff. But when you watch Mary Earth, she's a proper goalie. She could play for a men's team, no problem. And I'm sure there's obviously other goalkeepers as talented as her. So I think one of the biggest growths of the women's game, I think, has been the position of goalkeeper and how they actually are like proper goalies now and the brave and commanding and shot stopping and good good pings on them and stuff and you know can hit a diag on the switch and stuff. Mary Herbs is a class goalkeeper, so yeah. I mean, talking about about women's football, obviously Man United, Manchester City, two of the the best women's setups in the country, probably the world to be fair. Um, any chance of a, a Manchester Central women's team coming up? Or, you know, with, with football futures, obviously, there's a, a whole new generation of, of young girls that have been inspired by the the Lionesses and, and the way that they've performed, um, a new generation of role models. Is it something that, that potentially in the in the future, football futures or Central are, are looking to get into? Uh, you know what, I'd love to say yeah, and you'd never say never. We just have enough issues enough problems on our plate feeling one single men's senior team so yeah of course you would love it imagine a Manchester Central female team playing in the white black and red and you know going up against some other local teams and doing it and I think you can progress quite quite well if you've got a good outfit and a good team in women's football so we'd love to do it listen football futures whatever guys that continues over the years you know is more likely to have a girls team because it's further education and you can you know get them in early and put them in a youth team and, and give them some you know good versions of football, but it's just not really been on our radar as yet. We've not really got the capabilities of pulling it off. So I would say, never say never, but it's probably not in the short term, really. Yeah, wicked, no worries. Well, that wraps up episode number two of the podcast, uh, The Central Chat. Put that in your podcast. Thank you very much, Paul, for for giving up your time and, and coming on having a chat. Hopefully we'll have you back for the next episode and we'll have a, a few more people that we can we can float ideas around between have a oh have let's a, roll out some of the chat. old brigade eh? let's see what they've got to say about the going on. yeah and by yeah. the way I'm getting dark now I'm going to be disappearing off into the distance soon so it's good job we finished there's no electricity <laughs> right. in rooms though yeah <laughs> Perfect. Um, once again, shout out to to yourself and the guys at Football Futures. Thank you very much for sponsoring this podcast. Yeah, Everything yeah. really helps. And uh, yeah, good luck for for this this upcoming month. And we'll chat to you in a bit. See you later, mate. Cheers, mate. Bye.